Assalamualaikum and a very good day. Today, uh, I'll be presenting about approach to critically ill patients. Okay, I'm Dr. Abdul Jaba. I'm uh, the head of unit of the intensive care unit, Hospital Queen Elizabeth II in Kota Kinabalu. Okay, let's move on. So, as usual, what who is what is the definition of critically ill? These are the kind of patients which are at high risk of actual or potential life-threatening health problem. Basically, they are nearing death and we are trying to prevent death and trying to save them. So they typically requiring immediate life-saving procedures and they usually have multiple organ failures and have persistent and require persistent life-dependent supports. So in my point of view, the way I think about how to manage critically ill is that the core of it is to do a critical reviews with physiological-based intervention at the same time, we are doing an essential reviews with routine intensive care. I will explain to you about these critical reviews and essential reviews. And at the same time, we want to identification. We want to identify what is the definitive problem? What makes the patient sick? And employ evidence-based treatment uh, as a definitive treatment to make the patient better. So general approach for critically ill is uh, we should assess and intervene based on the physiology. So we don't, we also look at the definitive diagnosis, but we mainly assess and intervene and correct the physiology while treating the definitive problem. So at the same time, this sick and critically ill patient, we do have to respect abnormal physiology as an adaptive response towards critically ill condition. Because usually a normal patient which have some slightly deranged physiology will have heart rate to, to, to increase by about 200 or 110. But this kind of patient, when we receive them, they might have a very high tachycardia, like 140 heart rate beats per minute. And when we resuscitate them, them we don't expect to correct the heart rate until let's say 80s okay just enough that the perfusion is okay is all right then we don't have to like really really try to correct until a very very low tachycardia or low heart rate so our aim usually is just to restore back the perfusion and let the body try to heal itself because some physiological response can be tolerated and considered even normal and trying to correct it will be futile, such as fever, hyperglycemia, and hypercapnia. Especially hyperglycemia and hypercapnia. Uh, in if you know the uh, in the recent ICU studies, it's been proven that hypercapnia in ARDS is actually somewhat protective, because when we protect the lung in lung protective ventilation strategy, uh, the the mortality is markedly reduced and the complete lung complexion will markedly reduce. And hyperglycemia, of course, from the nice sugar trial, uh, you shouldn't do very intensive glucose correction because it may lead to even more problem. But the problem usually lies in the distinguishing adaptive response and maladaptive response. Until when the adaptation of the abnormal physiology is becoming maladaptive. It's coming way too much, and then when we have to correct it, it's actually a real challenge and require prudent and pragmatic approach. And always take into account benefit and risk in everything you do, whatever you want to do, and intervene in the patient. So, of course, at the same time, you have to identify root cause of critical illness and employing definitive treatment, such as pneumonia, you have to give antibiotics, and so on. So the general approach uh, of critical ill patient in ICU, usually I will explain in two very different, uh, in two parts. The first part is the critical review, which I will explain in ABCDEF. And accession review, I will explain in uh, fast heart maidens. So we go to the critical review first. Critical review because it's very important and very critical in the critically ill patient. 
So critical review of critically ill is the best explained using ABCDE approach. Okay, ABCDE approach are essential in review and very critical of new patient and subsequent review every hour or every shift continuously around the clock for critically ill patient. Okay, so we see the patient and maintain and stabilize the patient, assess around the clock every hour, every minute. But if you see the mnemonic ABCDE, actually it's, you have to go back way back to 1985 when Dr. Safa first introduced it in 1958 while managing the airway, when he introduced the first A and B. And subsequently, Dr. Cohenhausen described C in 1960 to properly manage the circulation. But ABCDE really uh, grow into fame and uh, being adopted worldwide after Dr. Styler and his family survived a plane crash and he pioneered the structured use of ABCD approach because at that time when he was treated in emergency department after the trauma and with, uh, to him and the family uh, that, that happened to them, he saw that the management was a little bit, a very haphazard, it's not properly structured. And uh, so he introduced this approach which have been established and follow up until today. Okay, so we go to the A. A represents airway. So when you talk about airway, you have to look into several aspects. Number one is the airway noises. Second is position of head, foreign body, fluid secretion, and also edema. So I explain and divide into two, which is non-intubated patients and intubated patients. So for non-intubated patients, when you see them and review them in the ICU, you have to look for stride door sound, obstructed airway sounds, snoring like, and you have to see uh, if the patient have like an obstructed airway sound, you have to do head tail and chin lift to open obstructed airways. You have to scoop for any foreign bodies or use magic for steps if not possible to use by fingers or hand. And then you have to uh, do suction excessive secretion from the mouth and also encourage patient to cough excessive secretion. And then if you suspect the patient to have airway edema, you have to be intubate them early in case of inhalation and injury, for example. Okay, so for intubated patient, you have to really look and listen for any leak ETT sound and check for the cuff, uh, ETT cuff. And then you have to ensure no extreme tilting left or right and check for ETT depth adequacy. And you have to think of block ETT with clots or crusted secretion as this can significantly impact the airway and make it less patent. And this will severely impact patient breathing. So you also have to assess regularity of suction and types of secretion because when the nurses have to do more suction and the secretion becoming in, be increasing, it might indicate if there is any new pneumonia, new infection of the lungs. And you have to, you can also objectively see whether the patient is responding to your treatment, to your new antibiotic, where the, the regularity of the suction is becoming lesser and lesser. And last one, if you suspect or you are treating the patient for laryngeal edema, you have to do cuff leak test. So with this regard for ICU and critically ill patient, usually they are ventilated. I want to teach you and explain regarding uh, to see the expiratory flow shapes. Okay, so when you have uh, when you see at the ventilator, you you usually have a pressure pressure time chart and flow time chart. This is the flow time chart. You can see here the normal flow time chart. We will start with inspiration, and then it will uh, and the inspiration will go up and down. The the flow will become lesser towards the end of the inspiration, and then expiration will occur passively, and will uh, negative flow means the from the patient to the ventilator, okay? So the normal shape is triangular and with shallow curve. And in the first second of the passive expiration, about 80% of the tidal volume has already been uh, exhaled out, okay? Uh, area under the curve of the inspiratory flow chart is actually, when you calculate the area under the curve, is representing the tidal volume. So when you have more than 80%, Actually, normal is 90%, but you have more than 80% is considered normal. Okay, means 80% of the tidal volume already 
in, exhale out. So if you encounter patient of bronchial asthma, bronchial asthma or COPD, you will have a, a deep concave curve in where the passive expiratory volume is less than 80% in the first second. In this case, resistance will increase as the lung volume reduce. All right? So this deep concave represents lower airway obstruction. So what I want to talk about in the airway is this, the last one, where upper airway obstruction uh, will cause, is the one that we have to look for in A, airway. So in upper airway obstruction, in like uh, clots in the ETT or secretion, thick secretion, thick mucus in the ETT, impairing the airway airflow and causing airflow obstruction is considered upper airway obstruction. So the, the expiratory flow waveform will become flat, or we call it horizontal, or even very linear slope. And uh, of course, in the first second of passive expiratory phase is less than 80% of the tidal volume being exhaled. Tidal volume being in, inhaled, and then uh, the exhale part is less than 80% in the first second. At this time, this is a, they, we consider resistance is constant. So in the, this is a normal graph. The first second of passive expiratory volume is more than 80% of the tidal volume. So this is a lower, uh, lower airway obstruction where the deep concave curve occur and the uh, uh, passive expiratory volume is lesser than 80% of the tidal volume area under the curve of inspiratory flow chart. Okay, so we go back to the upper airway obstruction. So this is an example of upper airway obstruction where the expiratory flow waveform become flat and the first second of the passive expiratory volume is less than 80%. So this is what happened in the trachea. This is example of tracheal edema. This is bronchoscope picture just beyond the ETT. Okay, this is based from the talk that I attended two years, three years ago. So I had a case in ICU, my ICU, on 9 of June 2021, just in time for me to show you the real life example. This was a case of leptospirosis case with a pulmonary hemorrhage. And at that time, overall condition was improving clinically. Upon morning review, we, not, we noted that the patient was very tachypneic, dyspneic, sweating, but no desaturation. Uh, mind you, the patient already wake up, alert, and suddenly he had this episodes of very severe respiratory distress. Auscultation show reduced air entry bilaterally and the ventilator waveform shows. Yes, you are right. The upper airway obstruction and the expiratory flow waveform is flat and horizontal. So as you can see, first you take the first, you have to uh, and estimate how much is one second and then you draw a same line, one second here and then you see the the, the expressive expiratory volume is smaller than the inspiratory volume. It's less than 50, 80%. But the more importantly is the graph is very flat. It's horizontal, representing upper airway obstruction. Okay? So this is what we had when we pull out the ETT. The ETT was blocked with clots. Okay? Almost complete block. So after we change to new ETT, the graph improve but it's not I still have some obstruction so we do bronchoscope and we clear off all the clots in the trachea and the both main bronchi on right and left okay so after we did the bronchoscope the respiratory flow waveform become much better and more 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 uh, better concave i would say all right and then when the patient regain back the spontaneous breathing this is what you can see Okay. okay, moving on to B, to the breathing part. So after airway, you have to assess the breathing of the patient. Okay, so as usual, when you went, when you went to medical school before, uh, you do inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, and the new one is a sonography. As an ICU doctor, you have to know, it's like a very essential, you have to know about sonography how to do ultrasound and radiography as well. This is essential as a ICU doctor, okay? So for non-intubated patient, you have to identify and assess types of oxygen support, whether the patient is on nasal prong, face mask, high flow nasal cannula, or non-invasive ventilation. And you have to observe the pattern of breathing. Is he breathing shallow, 
rapidly, deep breathing, uh, all sort of type of breathing, okay? Whether they pay, and you have to see the respiratory rate, how tachypnic is the patient, how good is the effort of breathing, is the patient having sinuses, okay? So you have to also check for oxygen connection, check the flow meter connection, any tracheal deviation, and subcontinuous empyzema. Okay, so for intubated patient, you have to monitor the breathing part, not only on the pattern of breathing of the patient, you have to look also at the ventilator settings, especially peak pressure, plateau pressure, auto peep, ABG, any desynchrony. You have to look at the SpO2 at the same time, of course, for the non-intubated patient as well. And you see the pattern of breathing also and uh, respiratory rate. Okay, uh, sometimes you do have to uh, employ some ventilator maneuvers to measure the plateau pressure and to see is there any the level of auto peep. And you have to check the ventilator tubing and the HME, make sure it's, uh, it's not heavily soaked, there is no water uh, trapped or drained, I mean, the excessive water inside the respiratory tubing. And you have to check the chest tube and the chest tube bottle, chest tube bottle as well. So you have to do percussion to look for any dullness or resonant bilaterally, as well as from the back if necessary. Uh, Examination of percussion and auscultation must be done appropriately in according to surface anatomy of the lungs. This is the one thing that uh, a lot of junior doctors uh, make a common mistake by them. Okay, You have to listen for breath characters and entry equity of both sides, crepitations, ronchi, both inspiratory and expiratory phase. For sonography, you have to scan as well all the six lung ultrasound area and you have to look for A, B, C profile, check diaphragm levels or height bilaterally, rule up pleural or pericardial effusion. In the radiography x-ray, you have to see any tracheal deviation, stenosis, lung collapse, pneumothorax, pneumonia, and you have to look at the heart size. And then you have to check for intubated patient, you have to check for ETT depth, CVL depth, diaphragm level, lung volumes, and pleural drain or chest tube depth. Okay, so when I talk about uh, surface anatomy of the lungs, as you can see, the common mistake of even senior doctors is to examine only chest or memory area of the lung. So in front of the part, usually they just auscultate to the, at the front, right side, left side, and then that's it. Okay, But you actually have to remember when you auscultate from the front, you only listen to the uh, parts of the upper lobe. Of the lung as well. You don't even listen to the mid middle lobe and also the lower lobe. Okay, so you have to. It's compulsory to assess all parts of the lung to ensure full recovery of critically ill patient. Because most of the time, very severely critically ill, the lung problems are heterogeneous. Means it doesn't involve front part of the lung or I mean upper lobe of the lung. It will involve sometimes right upper lobe and left lower lobe. So you have to see and assess and. Uh, in which part of the lungs are affected. Why is this important? Because by applying knowledge of surface anatomy, you know when you assess the part from the front, you are assessing the upper lobe. When you, when you, list, when you assess from the axillary, infra axillary, you are assessing the middle lobe and as well as the lower lobe. When you're assessing from the back, you are actually assessing the, the lower lobe. Okay? By applying this knowledge of surface anatomy, you can do a targeted assessment, identifying where exactly the affected lungs without CT scan because we can usually use lung ultrasound to see whether there is any pleural effusion, lung collapse, consolidation, all we can see through an ultrasound. So the insight gained on exact location of lesion on which exact part of the lungs is involved is actually important to, to provide improve targeted therapy okay so we have you can target the chest physiotherapy on which part of the lung that we want to target it's a targeted chest physiotherapy and it's a targeted postural ventilation improvement so let's say because of the nature of the physiology of the ventilation and profusion of the lungs if the lung is collapsed from the back so the best way to to open up the lung is to make it a non-dependent area so that means you have to put it at the at the non-dependent area means at the top. So you have to prone the patient and make the patient lie prone and breathe and prone position. This is the same, the exact reason why a lot of COVID patients, we also do uh, prone position 
self-prone position uh, and let the patient do prone uh, long and long time for long time, maybe at least 16 hours a day. Okay. So for the lung ultrasound area, you have to follow the international consensus of lung ultrasound using the R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6. Also on the left is L, L1 to L6. So these parts of the lung represent the, the appropriate the lobe according to surface anatomy of the lung. So L1, L2 is the uh, upper lobe and some part of the middle lobe. L3 is the mid, L3 and L4 mostly in the some part of the upper lobe, middle lobe and lower lobe as well. So and the, but the from the back is mostly is the lower lobe. Okay. So according to the ultrasound ABC profile, you can uh, identify whether the, well, the lungs is collapsed, atelectasis, you having pneumonia or consolidation, and having pleural revision or loculated. And by knowing this, you have you can employ targeted therapy. Just for example, just now in the uh, in the afternoon, uh, one of my patients had a left lower lung collapse, although he was breathing normally spontaneously after extubation. When we detected this, so we asked him to lie down on the side, on the left side up, so to improve the ventilation on that particular targeted area of the lung. Okay, so uh, talking about A and B, when you combine it, uh, maybe it's important to, to explain regarding desaturation troubleshooting when patient is on ventilator. So usually you can get, uh, you will get alarms go, go off and when patient on ventilator. So the patient is desat, desaturation, SPO2 dropping from 100, 90, 80. So you have to attend to patient immediately, check the SPO2 probe, if, if you see the, the waveform is okay, so it's most likely the SPO2 probe is the, press, the, correct, the placement is correct. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is to increase the FiO2, increase the oxygen concentration, and you have to think of two things. You have to think of the gas machine side, oxygen outlet at the wall, or you have to think at the patient side. These two can be the potential problem. So the first thing you have to do is to disconnect ventilator and manually back, connect it to the flow meter, 15 liter per minute, and then let the reservoir back uh, expand, and then you manually back. If you see patient improve, if patient improve means from the ATT down to the lung and all is all right, no problem. So probably it's the ventilator, circuit, gas, or oxygen supply problem. But if the condition of the patient desaturation is same or worsen, it might be the ATT or the patient problem. Okay, so... So we go, so like I said, mineral bagging, difficult to bag, ATT, operation problem. So we go to the difficult to bag, ATT, operation problem first. So when you encounter this problem, first thing you have to do is to insert suction catheter. If the suction catheter, you have to use the biggest ball, the largest suction catheter and pass it through the ATT. If it's smooth and easy, the ATT is not blocked. If it's tight and difficult to insert, that means the ATT block, king or patient is biting the tube. All right, so when it's smooth, it's and easy to pass suction catheter, and then you might, uh, ATT is not blocked, so you might have a lung compliance issue. What you can do is you can force embo back the patient and then connect back to the ventilator and employ lung recruitment strategy, which I won't be explaining in this talk. In, in this talk, okay, it's, that is will be will be running out of time, okay. So if the ATT block or king are binding, this block airway issue, so you have to resolve, either you have to change the tube or usually we have to change the tube. Huh? So you can also employ whatever I have taught just now regarding the respiratory flow waveform to enhance your confidence that this is a block airway issue. So, so when it's easy to back and patient condition improve, oxygen improve, so it's not a compliance or airway problem, it might be the gas supply, ventilator, or the circuit problem. So you have to run through the equipment from oxygen source till the respiratory tubing and see, check one by one. So go from the oxygen supply tank until the end of the circuit. Okay. So first, you have to see at the MAC4 connection, if your hospital using MAC4 connection, ensure the ventilator oxygen hose connection is tightly, tightly clicked and into the oxygen port firmly and not loose. This is the loose when you can see the groove, it means it's loose and it's not connecting properly. 
when it's connected uh, like this and the picture on the right that means the oxygen connection is uh, is okay it's good next one you have to see at the inspiratory and aspiratory port make sure the tubing is not disconnected ensure the hme and filter are un, sorry are not drenched in fluid and not blocked okay there's no fluid if it is fluid or heavily secret heavy secretion then you have to change the uh, filter okay so ensure HME and filter are not drenched in fluid and not blocked sorry it's typo error make sure tubing is not disconnected okay and no leak from the tubing and check ventilator alarm to see any problems detected and then you have you can go through the uh, to the tube from the ventilator check all the parts of the tube make sure there's no leaking of air and make sure there is no excessive water inside the tubing there is no kinking of the tubing and being compressed by something else and then you have to see all the connection you have to see all the the holes there whether it is properly sealed or closed and then there is no leak and change HME if heavily soaked make sure ETT not king block pass through suction catheter and no air leak sound if air leak sound then you have to eat to have to reflate back the cuff ETT ETT cuff so going into the C cardiovascular so I I divided into history or review and examination and intervention okay so for history review you have to review pre-morbid cardiovascular status and end organ complication like acute kidney injury, liver failure, among other things. Because cardiovascular status can lead to the other organ complication. Inquire on persistent symptoms suggestive for hyperperfusion. So when the patient came in with some anemic symptom, dizziness, lightheadedness, syncope, near fainting. So when the patient admitted to ICU, see whether the treatment given in the emergency department by medical team in the ward whether it has improved by the time the patient walk admitted into the icu you have to review this is the most important thing you have to review pre-admission volume of fluids administered right from the time patient walk into the ed until the patient go to the ward and come to the icu you have to see and count every single meals of fluids all right and then look for estimated blood loss if the patient coming from surgery into the ICU. Okay, check uh, and also see how much they are already given to the patient, how much pack cell blood products. Check for any allergy to resuscitation fluids, and you have to estimate body weight and look for documented actual weight because some cases you do employ uh, targeted fluid therapy based on the patient's body weight, such as dengue, dengue, dengue cases. And the most important in C is actually examination of the CCTVR. This is very, 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 very important. I can't stress this uh, more, but it's very important. Okay. So CCTVR is color, capillary refill, temperature, pulse volume, and pulse rate. You have to see the color of the patient, whether it's pink, whether it's pale or cyanosis. You have to check the capillary refill. You have to feel the temperature. Means the temperature is you have to touch the patient, whether the periphery is cold, warm, and then you have to check the pulse volume. Not only the radial pulse, you have to check at the carotid pulse, brachial pulse, radial pulse. So if all three are very strong, that means the perfusion is good. But the, if the carotid pulse and brachial pulse is strong, but the radial pulse is not good, probably patient is slightly under volume or maybe has some problem with the pumping of the heart. And you have to see the pulse rate okay so for blood pressures you not only you have to see the normal blood pressure you have to see exactly what is the problem systolic diastolic mean pulse pressure variations of the of the bp where is the diacrotic notch how is the trends of the blood pressure and how is the response to the therapy and you can do echocardiography you have to see you can see the preload diastolic expansion lv contractility rv size atrial sizes efficient and ibc sizes but this is Maybe the very most important part is that you have to also check for perfusion markers, which is CCTVR, like the level, SVO2, urine output. SVO2 may or may not be done routinely. Okay, You have to get an 12 lead ECG on admission to ICU. And if necessary and indicated, you have to do uh, repeat 12 lead ECG. And we, by default, we, may, we, we, we do continuous ECG monitoring all the time, all seconds, all minutes every hour all the time and then if you have the luxury of doing so uh, you can do advanced hemodynamic like pico or uscom to further evaluate the cardiovascular so 
for physiology based intervention in patient of in ICU patient we usually refer to this oxygen flux equation okay oxygen flux equation dictates uh, the delivery of oxygen towards all the tissue okay oxygen is brought by the red blood cell okay this is oxygen equation for oxygen delivery so if you see the equation the most important part is the q q is the cardiac output cardiac output is uh, is the pumping of the heart times the heart rate okay when the when the when the cardiac output uh, when the heart pumps the cardiac output goes out about 5 liter per minute you at the same time you don't uh, you you also have to note the highway which is the blood vessel if the bp is all right mep is good means the highway is okay if the highway is too wide but the heart cannot pump adequately then the forward flow and the perfusion is not good also so that's why you have to maintain a good bp to manage, ensure the highway is ngam ngam very good uh, so the perfusion pressure is also uh, okay for the organ to receive the uh, blood okay and then you have to ensure adequate hemoglobin uh, usually we aim at least 7 milli, 7 gram per deciliter and above and you have to check spo2 which is the, the hemoglobin saturation with oxygen. If you have good cardiac output, good hemoglobin, by, but your lung is bad and SpO2 is not good, the oxygen, when it, well, all the RBC that went to your tissues will not have enough oxygen and patient will have a problem. Okay, so oh, what makes the hemoglobin saturated well with oxygen? Yes, so this is, uh, this is what the lung function is all about to ensure the oxygen arrive in the capillaries and also the pulmonary arteries and uh, sorry pulmonary vein into the heart and then to increase uh, lungs job is to uh, increase the amount of dissolved oxygen in the blood which is there in the form of PaO2 so when PaO2 is adequate or high enough then only it can saturate the hemoglobin all right so to know what dictates the oxygenation from the chemical oxygen PO2 into saturating the hemoglobin, which is the oxygen dissociation curve. Okay, so oxygen dissociation curve is uh, we will turn will shift it to the left in the tissues to pro, to sorry in the lungs to promote uptake of oxygen, and we will shift to the right uh, to promote offloading of oxygen into the tissues. All the delivery of oxygen in the world uh, is, doesn't mean a thing if the locally in the tissue, the tissue cannot use the oxygen in the electron transport chain to produce fuel, which is ATP. In some cases like cyanide toxicity or uh, inhalational injury or burn with carbon monoxide poisoning, the cell cannot use the oxygen to produce ATP. You have to think about it also. So when I said CCTVR is the most important thing, it's a color, capillary field, temperature, pass volume, and pass rate. So this is the, the, the most important thing that we always do every day in ICU. Okay, so capillary field team is very important. So where do, where do, do, where do we do the capillary field time? Is it the finger, pop, nail, where? Palm, okay. So in this study in the Thailand, in Thailand, they did, they want to see where is the best place to do and they found out the best place to do it is in finger pulp and the best cut off actually is three seconds not two or two seconds or what okay three seconds but usually in textbook we we'll say two seconds uh, capillary refill time so when you see when you want to assess the blood pressure this is the arterial pressure waveform monitoring we uh, there's plenty of emotion that we can get from here we have to assess it properly and see what is the problem whether it's uh, vasodilatation vasoplegia or whether it is uh, Poor contractility of the heart and so on. Okay, so I'm not going to touch this because it will will take way too much time. Okay, so the intervention. How do you intervene and impact cardiovascular system? Okay, so you have to identify types of shock, whether it's cold shock, warm shock, and so on. Okay, and then you have to employ targeted therapy based on type of shock. You have to use judicious fluid types, volume, and rate administration. Everything matters. Not only the volume, not only the type as well as the rate on how fast you give okay patient can develop fully overload if you give small little 
uh, not so much fluid, but if you give too fast also, it, they can develop uh, fluid overload. Okay. And then you have to first determine if fluid required, then only test responsiveness. Okay. Fluid responsiveness, fluid responsive doesn't mean fluid required. Okay. So always think of optimizing effectiveness of vasoactive drug, vasoactive drugs as well. Okay, so this is the uh, some the you can say how do you want to check the the which one cold cold shock wet shock dry and warm okay you see, uh, you can read it on later lah. this is from the ICU protocol okay so basically you use CCTVR and then you check the volume status and then you check the peripheral secretion whether then you can come up whether it's a cardiogenic shock heart failure septic shock or mix. Okay, so, so the way I see and the way I approach patient in my daily and my point of view is usually every patient I will check for assessment of adequacy of profession. I will say, I was told to my MO, okay, profession is good, capillary, refill is chante, uh, warm periphery, pass volume good, pass rate good, lactate is normal, less than two, urine ampoule is good, acidosis improving and reducing hemodynamic support, no rate is reducing. Okay, if everything okay, all right, good. If not okay, then you have to see what, what intervention you can do to improve the pressure, okay? I usually think in three, three, three pathway, whether it's volume, whether it's oxygenation, whether the patient need any vasoactive agent. Uh, very easy. If the HB is low, you replace with blood. If, if, the you do you just put a simple echo if the heart doesn't contract properly you give the butamin watch out the bp when you give the butamin because it can it can vasodilate the vessel you can you need might need to give noradrenaline to counteract the hypotension okay oxygenation you can adjust the ventilator setting according to the requirement increasing the oxygenation support and for the volume once HB is okay, then you have to give fluid. You can assess for fluid responsiveness. If the adequation is, if the profusion is not adequate, once profusion adequate, majority of these patients, once profusion is adequate, they just need some time. You just have to wait. Do not need to give, no need to give some more fluid and more fluids and more fluid. In fact, you should stop fluids when the profusion is adequate just to prevent further AKI because the more you give fluid, the more worse the kidney will become because the fluid will go into the interstitial of the kidney and it will cause interstitial, uh, interstitial edema of the kidney. So they will worsen the AKI. Okay. Once profession adequate, just wait for some time for the consciousness to improve, for the patient to wake up, for the organ function to improve, especially the urine output. Okay, if the perfusion is inadequate, like corporeferies, this is the uh, this is how I approach let's say like a possibilities of case scenario. Okay, so let's say this one patient is having perfusion inadequate. He had cold peripheries, weak pulse volume, tachycardia, persistent hypotension, lactate more than two, with reducing urine output. You have to remember the oxygen flux equation. Okay, go back to the cardiac output, HB saturation, PaO two, and so on. Okay. So remember, HB is good 10 for this patient, let's say, HB is 2, SPO 200%, you check the echo, good, strong contractility of the left ventricle, but the patient is still in hypotension. It's likely to be distributive shock, which is septic shock and vasoplegia. okay? So remember the, the clinical picture, okay? Hypotension, weak pulse volume, core peripheries, but uh, depends. Sometimes, most of the patient, septic shock is warm peripheries, but when they go into late septic shock, the preference will be cold. Okay, so according to sepsis guideline, you have to give IV cholesterol 30 ml per kilo. If given already, proceed to the next. If IV cholesterol 30 ml per kilo already given, you have to perform fluid responsiveness test. And this fluid responsiveness test is, is two types, which is uh, one test dependent on heart lung interaction, another one is doesn't is independent of the heart lung interaction. What is heart lung interaction? This is best as described in Frank Stanley curve, where the increase in preload will increase in the contractility. Uh, subsequently, will improve the BP. Okay, so 
but this is only applicable if the patient have a good ventricular systolic function. Okay, so if the patient you suspect is to be under volume, you can give fluid. But if you want to see the fluid response, the stiffness, the test becoming positive, you have to give the vitamin for you. When then you only can only see the actual response. You can see the actual uh, like IVC or PLR. I mean IVC or all all other fluid response new tests to be to be to be to be accurate. Yes, to be accurate. Okay, I have encountered some patient like this. I do give the vitamin first, some norad to counteract the hypotension from the vitamin, and then once the contractility is good, then I only do the IVC contractility scan and all. Okay, so. The test dependent on the heart lung interaction for it to be very accurate. You have to ventilate the patient at tidal volume of 8 mils per kilo ideal body weight. No spontaneous breathing, no arrhythmias, having good ventricular function or contractility. Okay, so this is, but if you don't have, maybe you can use, but you have to take it with, uh, you have to give some precaution and you might think this might, may not be accurate. You can still do. Okay. Uh, both tests independent of heart lung interaction and dependent on the heart lung interaction requires arterial waveform analysis. Usually, the most common one is pulse pressure variation. Okay, so some of the tests dependent on lung interaction is a uh, arterial waveform analysis using PPV, IBC or SBC variation. Okay, aortic flow velocity like SCOM or pulse oximetry platysmography using uh, advanced SpO2 analysis. And aspiratory occlusion test, EEOT, or tidal volume challenge. Uh, one of the most popular is passive leg raising test, which is independent of the heart lung interaction. That means you can do in patient in spontaneous breathing, uh, having some arrhythmias. Uh, probably we would like it's no arrhythmia. Lah, okay, so doesn't have to be ventilated or intubated. Okay. Okay, so then going back to the patient just now, chrysolite given, perform fluid response test. Okay, not fluid responsive, but patient still hypotensive. After you give 30 mil per kilo, you do fluid response test like passive leg raising, and the BP does not improve. So that means patient is patient need vasopressor. Okay, of course in septic shock is not adrenaline. Let's go to another case. Cold periphery, sweet pulse volume, lactate 4.5, reducing urea output. HB is good, SpO2 good. Somewhat norm, low, normal, but still normal tensive. When you do an echo dilated LV, weak LV contractility, yes, you got it. It's likely cardiogenic shock. So you have to start low vitamin and watch out for hypotension when you start it. And you have, might have to start NORAD to counteract the hypotensive effect of the vitamin. Okay. If you have like advanced hemodynamic like PICO, USCOM, or Vigilio down here, it's very good. So, but it's very expensive. You can also do uh, assessment of the echo, LV, RV, contractility, sizes, and all. Okay, This is the passive lead reading test. You can read it on later. So for disability, D, uh, I mainly focus on the brain. Why is my patient not waking up? This is the everyday question that I ask to my MO. And I think of myself, why is my patient not waking up? Is it because there is still residual sedative agent like midazolam or any other sedation, just off the sedation? If patient sedation has been off for so long, for a long time, then we have to think of intracranial versus extracranial causes. Intracranial easy, you can do CT brain. Extracranial causes, you have to see whether the extracranial causes is organ-related or non-organ-related. Organ-related is like liver failure, renal failure, and so on. Non-organ-related like uh, toxic, toxins uh, or drugs or anything like this. Lah. Okay, so neurological management, every day you have to do quick neurological examination. The simplest one is the papillary light reflex, corneal reflex, grimace reflex. Okay, you have to do frequent GCS examination. You have to control seizure if it happens. You have, if you have a patient doing cerebral protection, you have to do it properly. And uh, you also have to assess for agitation or delirium. And you have to see you have to see whether the patient is disabled. Like I see acquired weakness have to be uh, monitor, assess, and treat aggressively. You have to see the glucose of the patient, avoid hypoglycemia to prevent uh, to prevent a brain brain injury. Okay. 
glucose uh, okay so any toxicology assessment you have to do tdm whatever possible whatever necessary okay so the last one is e and f e is exposure check every inch of patient's body being vigilant is the key you have to look at the wounds bad sores scars any new old potential any wounds you have to think of accidental versus non-accidental injuries it might give you clues about regarding patient is ivdu marks or having heavy mark but the most important thing you have to protect patient decency at all times we know all the patient is in icu is intubated sedated and unconscious but you have to protect their decency at all time you have to protect their privacy you have to protect uh, their their honor and and cover them with proper clothes and put them with blanket and then for the f some patient some people put in e some people put as f f is a fever management which is thermal management hypothermia is very bad fever as is very bad as well so you have you need to treat both aggressively you have to promote heat heat loss in fever you have to promote heat retention in hypothermia because hypothermia can worsen acidosis and coagulopathy it will lessen oxygen release at tissues you can use bear hugger at force airwarming device you can use you have to give warm flap and warm fluid and warm blood you can use ice cubes cooling in malignant cases of fever and crt cooling in extreme cases okay so the next approach is to do essential review which is the facet maidens okay so facet maidens is this okay so facet pneumonia is very popular in icu okay so but but not not many knows is the story of three vincent okay so it started off in 2005 where vincent jl popularized fast hug by a paper title give your patient a fast hug at least once a day the title of the paper and next one in 2009 fast hug bid vincent wr updated the already popular fast hug to include bid and then the last one the latest one is fast hug maiden in 2011 given by Vincent HM to introduce later structured well designed study expansion into the widely famous FASHAC BID okay so this actually a paper FASHAC maidens is actually uh, presented by a ICU pharmacist okay having a pharmacist is very important to your ICU is the only single intervention or uh, important person that across the board across all research is being shown is very effective I, the ICU will improve if you have a, a dedicated ICU pharmacist. Okay, so this pharmacist uh, presented and proposed this fast heart maiden, which I think is what we already do every day, and it's just being put into mnemonics. Okay, mnemonics. Okay, so the first one F is feeding. So steps to start feeding is the the first one is to rule out any contraindication to feeding. Okay, number two is to ensure the rice tube inside two and patient able to tolerate feeding. Okay, if the patient not intubated, patient can drink or tolerate feeding orally, and then you have to start as you have to start enteral nutrition as early as possible and feasible. First, you have to calculate nutrient score to determine whether the patient is high nutritional risk or low nutritional risk to avoid having refeeding syndrome. You have to measure the height and actual weight to get the BMI. You have to establish the goal of feeding for protein and calories based on BMI. And then you have to remember you have to target only seventy percent of total calorie goal within the first seventy two hours of admission, in or acute phase of illness. So EN should be delayed in shock with hemodynamic instability. Of course, the gut failure will happen because the the blood being shunted away from the least least important a lesser important organ like gut, and the gut cannot absorb the fluid. All right, the gut absorb the uh, feeding. So severe hypoxemia and cirrhosis. Yes, same same reason. Active upper GI bleed, all of this is considered gut failure, higher possibility of gut failure. So acute bowel ischemic, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome, GRV more than 500 mils in six hours. Okay, so you have to provide EN via nasal gastric or oral gastric tube with adequate size 10 to 12 French after confirming correct placement by the following methods. Okay, so this is the nutrient score you have to calculate. If you have uh, this patient, you have to be careful to not to, uh, not for the patient not to have a refeeding syndrome. Okay, it's very dangerous to have refeeding syndrome. Okay, so this is the goal of the uh, feeding you have to follow from the ICU Malaysia ICU management protocol, uh, based on the BMI. Okay, so next one is A. A is analgesia. ICU is actually very painful place to be. 
pain is uh, because this is described by many ICU survivors in many studies done. The, the one of the thing they always they, they all agreed and they remembered is ICU is being very it's very painful. Okay, so you have to manage pain in the ICU better. We have to manage the ICU. We have to manage the pain in ICU better. So pain in ICU best understood in two categories: pain at rest, which is the baseline pain, and procedural procedural pain. So pain at rest, which is the baseline pain, majority of them in ICU develop moderate to severe pain. Who are at risk for pain at rest? Continuous pain all the time. Patient which has which had anxiety and depression uh, illness before the ICU. If the patient is younger age, have more than one comorbidity, have history of surgery prior to ICU admission, means the the patient went to the ICU, eh, went to the OT to do surgery, laparotomy and so on, and go to the ICU. ICU. This combination, of course, understandable, will have pain at rest. Okay, and then patient we have ADL dependent premorbidly before the ICU. So procedural pain is very important. Several procedural pain associated with severe adverse event. So nurse do project describe this procedural pain can lead to tachycardia, bradycardia, hypotension, hypotension, bradycardia, ventilator distress. This is preventable with adequate pain assessment and preemptive analgesia. In studies done by Puntilo. Uh, Puntilo et al. Puntilo et al. studied and certified procedures in ICU that causes significant pain. This is the procedures that are most painful, which is turning. Right? Turning. Wow. You see, we thought it's turning is just a normal thing, but it's actually quite painful for the patient. Most painful. Wound drain removal, wound care, arterial line insertion. Yeah. My medical officer, arterial line insertion, insertion is very painful. So make sure you give LA first. And then you have to, chest tube removal also is very painful. You have to give LA before you remove the chest tube. And all the others also are painful like ET suctioning. ETT suctioning, okay? So next one, FASS is sedation. Sedation is very important. Uh, second after the pain. So to practice sedation in Malaysia in ICU, we always follow analgo sedation. We have to prioritize analgesia and pain control. As a side effects of Energesia side effect of energesia of choice, which is FPOT, will have some sedative effect. This usually will be adequate. So we have to determine the goal of sedation of, of every shift in ICU. So when you come into shift, when you patient, when you want to assess the patient every shift, you have to determine. Now you want a patient to be in light sedation or deep sedation. Light sedation is using RAS minus two to plus one. In most of the patient, most of the time, we will employ light sedation. So deep sedation only for specific indication. This is the RAS score that we use to assess sedation level of the patient. So deep sedation only on the specific nine indication, head injury, post-cardiac arrest care, on high bursopressors, on a high ventilator setting, prone position, massive pulmonary hemorrhage, severe bronchiasma, tetanus, and on non marine vascular blocking agent. So you have to avoid benzodiazepine like midazolam as much as possible. Midazolam at high doses if required for deep sedation. Uh, use midazolam at high dose if required this sedation before adding propofol and try to avoid desimilatomidine because it's not suitable for deep sedation. It will have a lot of side effects. You have to you, you can use propofol desimilatomidine for short-term sedation. This is applicable to most of the patient. T for FAST, T is thromboprophylaxis. Okay, as you know, critically ill patients are not mobilizing, lying on the bed all the time and they have multiple illness, critically ill, a lot of inflammation inside the body, or the blood is not moving well, so there are increased risk of venous thromboembolism. Bef before you start any prophylaxis, you have to assess the bleeding risk. Okay? You have to know that pharmacological prophylaxis are superior to placebo or mechanical prophylaxis. So as much as possible, we have to start the patients on any pharmacological prophylaxis. This is becoming almost compulsory already, okay? When pharmacological prophylaxis is truly contraindicated, you only you use mechanical prophylaxis, okay? As some typo error, okay? So pharmacological prophylaxis are superior to placebo or mechanical prophylaxis. This is uh, shown in the large observational trial of more than 200,000 patients on, on matching pair of 80,000 patients. When they compare direct pharmacological prophylaxis, it to placebo or mechanical prophylaxis. 
Pharmacological, pharmacological profession shown reduction by 18% risk of death from BTE. So in another, uh, this is the study done by Dr. Lily MD. Okay. So T is from uh, assess contraindication and bleeding risk before starting pharmacological profile axis. This is the contraindication. So you have to use low molecular weight heparin like clexin for patients with risk factors of BTE. This is the risk factors. And you have to use heparin for patients without risk factor of BTE. You have to weigh the benefit and risk between the thromboembolism and uncontrolled bleeding. So uh, you have to adjust the low molecular weight heparin like clexin accordingly and discuss with the surgeon, always discuss with the surgeon prior to starting anticoagulant for post-operative patient. Do not do decision by yourself. Always discuss. I feel best being managed as a teamwork. Okay, It's always about teamwork. All right. So they always discuss with the surgeon prior to starting anticoagulant. Ask them because they know better about the bleeding risk of their own patient because they did the surgery. All right. So you have to continue anticoagulant until patient is fully ambulatory or discharged from the hospital. About mechanical thrombophilaphylaxis, only IPC, which is our pneumatic cuff, intermittent pneumatic compression device are preferred for high-risk BTE, contraindicated to receive pharmacological agent. Okay, Because uh, when your patient cannot take pharmacological agent, of course, you have to do some mechanical prophylaxis. However, our stocking, TED stocking, graduated compression stocking is actually not effective to reduce BTE. This is shown in CLOTS-1 trial, okay? quite, quite a famous trial also. Thus, in patient contraindicated for pharmacological agent, IPC, which is the pneumatic cuff, is the only, the only actual evidence-based treatment option. In CLOTS-3 trial, uh, the IPC, the pneumatic, pneumatic cuff, shown a very good result, almost 30% reduction in DVT, VTE, and reduction of 40% of mortality risk. Okay, This is the CLOTS-1 trial we shown that mechanical compression by uh, graduated compression stocking is actually not effective. Okay, so this is the mechanical thrombophoresis contraindication. And how about combine both mechanical and pharmacological agent? Actually, it does not show any benefit. This is shown in prevent trial, where it just show, it show no, significant of addition, no significant additional benefit for using IPC in addition to pharmacological agent. It is safe to use both, but there is no additional benefit. Okay, Because some center like my ICU, we don't have enough pneumatic cuff. So that's why, we, we by according to this study, we don't have to uh, use combination. Okay, Only in patients that we cannot give uh, from, uh, thrombo for ph uh, pharmacological agent, we use the pneumatic cuff. So next one is fast hug. FASTH. Okay, H is hyperactive or hypoactive delirium. Delirium is strongly associated with cognitive impairment and may be associated with longer hospital stay. How to manage delirium in ICU? You have to prevent delirium. You have to treat established delirium early. Okay, this is how you want to assess for and detect for any delirium by using CAM ICU. Okay, so methods to prevent delirium. One, you have to reduce the risk, risk reduction strategy for modifiable risk. Okay, you have to employ proven non-pharmacological method for patients we have uh, at high risk of delirium. So what is the risk factor? What are the risk factors for delirium? Modifiable risk is benzodiazepine use. Try not to use benzodiazepine if possible. And then try to avoid any blood transfusion. Okay, because these two are the known evidence-based modifiable risk factor for the delirium. So for non-modifiable risk factor, like patient who is older, elderly, having prior coma before any brain injury, any, having emergency surgery before coming to ICU, having polytrauma before coming to ICU, very high FSG score means it's very severely ill, very, very critically ill, sangat teruk. Okay? Increasing SR score means the very, a lot of comorbid, comorbidity, pre-morbid, multiple comorbidities. Okay? Bear in mind there is no pharmacological agent proven to prevent delirium. This is shown by MINE and USA and reduced trial. Okay, so non pharmacological uh, methods is the mainstay of to prevent delirium. You have to improve the cognition of the patient, like cognitive stimulation, reorientation, every shift and daily, 
use of music, use of clocks. In my ICU, I encourage the use of mobile phone and patient to, uh, and I encourage patient to improve their coordination, your, their cognition by, by making video calls to their family, uh, texting their friend using WhatsApp, taking selfies. All of this can improve their self-confidence, their, their motivation to become better. Even when they are intubated, they can still use their phones. Okay, it's actually quite helpful to help them improve. Okay, so you have to use sedation sparingly. We use this very cautious and evidence based, and then prevent sleep disruption by minimizing light and noise to prevent to promote sleep. You have to mobilize the patient frequently, and that this will improve overall condition and lead to better sleep. Use of hearing aids and glasses if patient use glasses before to improve hearing and visual impairment. I do have a case right now, it's very severe, severe impairment. I even have to borrow a hearing aid from the audi audiologist from Twin One. Okay, the next one is U, H-U-G. U is stress ulcer prophylaxis. You have the uh, stress, because of stresses in the ICU, the gut and the stomach don't have enough blood supply and are very uh, prone to have uh, ulcer. Okay, it's very simple. Number one, you have to detect any risk for stress ulcer. Number two, you have to start soup, SUP, stress ulcer prophylaxis. Once all the risk factor for stress ulcer have resolved, then you can stop SUP. Okay, this is the risk factor. So once patient have risk factor, which most of them do, then you can start ranitidine, IV, IV pento, IV osimeprazole, IV osimeprazole. We usually use IV pentoprazole in our ICU. When we de-escalate them to tablet, we de-escalate to tablet esomeprazole because it can be crushed and given through rice tube. So next one is G, glucose control. Monitor blood glucose every two hours initially, then later, probably if suitable, for hourly. You have to aim blood glucose around 8 to 10 and start insulin if glucose persistently above 10. This is the nice sugar trial, which effectively put down to rest any sort of discussion on what is the target of sugar that you should aim for in the ICU. This is the only one study you have to remember, nice sugar study. So back then, way back then, the intensivists likes to aim sugar very, very intensive, less than six, six millimole. And then it turns out that a lot of patients have very high proportion have severe hypoglycemia. But when they compare to the conventional glucose control, uh, becoming more relaxed where they just only aim less than 10, the, re the reduction of hypoglycemia is very, very well marked and, but they, and there is no mortality different. Okay, so we can allow higher until 10 millimole per liter. So next one is the new one, maidens. M is medication reconciliation. You have to check back whatever, the, all the medication that patient was taking before. Then you have to restart back all, you restart back all the, medication which are important okay restart medication deemed important for current condition unless it will be harmful such as antihypertensive restart back all the amlodipines and such anti heart failure medication you can restart back the lasix but don't have to restart medication not essential or harmful patients recovery like usually oral hypoglycemic agent like metformin uh, uh, glycoside and so on we do not need to restart because it actually will be harmful for the patient's recovery and you sh restarting medication should be done upon ICU admission and prior to discharge as well next one is MAA is antibiotic anti-infective you have to prioritize antibiotic stewardship use the proper agent this escalate once remote culture once culture is available do cultures work out appropriately choose the antibiotic appropriately and review daily indication dosage and stop this then i is indication of medication every day every shift we always do this in the icu we look at all the medication we review all the medication we review all the indications daily we off the medication if not needed or deemed not effective because icu is a polypharmacy we use a lot of drugs okay so we do we are we should assess for any drug interaction Look for potential medication or documentation error, which is very, very important, and assess any untreated indication for which drug therapy will be appropriate. So the lesser the drug is better. Okay. So the next one is D, is drug dosing. 
every day, every hour, every day, every other day in critically ill patient, renal and hepatic function may fluctuate frequently. So those adjustments may be needed for many drugs such as antibiotic, antifungal, and then uh, you have to adjust because one, you have to adjust because you want to achieve the desired clinical endpoint, and then you want to don't want the patient to have any side effect because when the renal function is worsening, the drug will stay longer in the blood and will cause uh, toxicity. Okay, some drug may even need TDM. Then you have to do TDM. Okay, so E is electrolytes. We review blood work daily. You, uh, to see whether the electrolytes normal or not, hemoglobin normal or not. But whenever possible for chronic patient, you should reduce the frequency of blood taking. And then you have to ensure optimal level of electrolytes to maintain normal physiology every day, but try not to be too, too rigid in your target. Okay, I don't even target sodium to become 145 or 140. All right, so I, I, I'm okay with 150 plus as long as the clinically patient is well. Right, so it depends, it comes by experience. Okay, so N M I D E N N N is no drug interaction, allergy, duplication, or side effect. You have to identify clinically important potential actual drug drug food interaction, may need pharmacist recommendation or adjustment if interaction exists. You have to explore any allergic reaction or side effect of drugs. You have to look for any drug duplication and stop any duplication drugs for similar indication. So, last one is S is stop dates for drugs. Majority of medication prescribed for a patient are not meant to continue indefinitely. You have to set a stop date for every drug and ensure the drugs will be off when the date comes. Conversely, the pharmacist should ensure that medication are not discontinued prematurely. So stop when it's about it's a time to stop. Don't stop when you do not need to stop. Okay. So remember, fast hug maidens for essential review. So you have to go from A, B, C, D, E, F every day. Every shift you have to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and fast heart maidens. So when you review patient every shift, okay. In between the full review, you monitor the patient hourly for any changes, any problem for the patient having patient have during the stay in the ICU. Okay. So uh, critical review is very critical and essential review is very essential. All right. Okay, nowadays everywhere is ICU. Okay, even if when you boarding a flight, looks like you are entering an ICU. Okay, anyway, thank you for listening. All right, hope you enjoy it. Okay, uh, stop recording.